الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وسلم أجمعين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل يا أهل الكتاب تعالوا إلى كلمة سواء بيننا وبينكم ألا نعبد إلا الله ولا نشك به شيئا ولا يتخذ بعضنا بعضا أربابا من دون الله فإن تولوا فقولوا شدوا بأننا مسلمون رب الشهل صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي My respected elders and my dear brothers and sisters I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh May the peace, mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of Almighty God be upon all of you. The topic of my talk is religion in the right perspective. Religion according to the Oxford Dictionary means a belief in a superhuman controlling power, a personal God or gods that deserve worship and obedience. In short, Religion means belief in God. I started my talk with a quotation from the glorious Quran from Surah Ali Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64. Kul yahl al kitab. Say, O people of the book. Ta'alaw ila kalimatin sawa in bayna wa baynakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'bud illa Allah that we worship none but one almighty God wala nushrika bihi shay'a that we associate no partners with him wala yattakhiza ba'duna ba'dan arbaban bi dunillah that we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah fa in tawallaw if then they turn back fa qulu shadu Say ye bear witness, be anna muslimoon, that we are Muslims bowing our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This verse of the glorious Quran, it is the master key for doing da'wah. It shows us how to talk to different types of people, people of different religions. What does it say? Ta'alaw ila kalimatin sawa in bayna wa baynakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which the first term, Allah na'abud illallah. That we worship none but one almighty God. One thing common, alhamdulillah, in all the scriptures of the major world religions is that the followers of that religion, the God which they worship, they believe He is the same for themselves as well as for the others. For example, the God which the Christians worship, they believe he's the same God for the Christians as well as non-Christians. The God which the Hindus worship, they believe he's the same God for the Hindus as well as non-Hindus. The God which we Muslims worship, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we believe that he's the same God for the Muslims as well as non-Muslims. As far as today's talk is concerned, I will be discussing four major world religions of the world. Hinduism, Judaism, Christianity and Islam. And in order to understand any religion in the right perspective, you should not look at the followers of that religion. In order to understand any religion in the right perspective, you should try and understand what the scriptures have to speak about Almighty God. You should try and understand the concept of God in that religion. Therefore, the best and the most authentic way of understanding the concept of God in any religion is to try and understand what the scriptures have to speak about Almighty God. Therefore, to understand any religion, in the right perspective, you need to look at the authentic sources of that religion, the sacred scriptures of that religion. First, we'll discuss the concept of God in Hinduism. If you ask a common Hindu that how many gods does he believe in? Some may say three, some may say ten, 
some may say 100, some may say 1000, while others may say 33 crore, 330 million. But if you ask a learned Hindu who is well versed with the scriptures, he will tell you that the Hindus should believe and worship in only one God. But the common Hindu, he believes in a philosophy called as pantheism. The common Hindu says that everything is God. The tree is God, the sun is God, the moon is God, the human being is God, the snake is God. What we Muslims say, everything belongs to God. Everything is God's. The tree belongs to God, the sun belongs to God, the moon belongs to God, the human being belongs to God, the snake belongs to God. So the difference between the common Hindu and us Muslims is the common Hindu says everything is God. We Muslims say everything belongs to God. So the major difference between the common Hindu and us Muslims is the common Hindu says everything is God. We Muslims say everything is God's. So the major difference between the common Hindu and us Muslims is the apostrophe S. If we can solve this difference of apostrophe S, the Hindus and the Muslims, we will be united. How do we do it? As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ta'alaw ila kalimatin sawa'in bainina wa bainakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'bud illallah. That we worship none but one almighty God. Now let's discuss the concept of God in Hinduism based on the sacred scriptures in Hinduism. Among the Hindu scriptures, one of the most sacred are the Upanishads. It's mentioned Chandogya Upanishad, chapter number 6, section number 2, verse number 1. Ikkam Vidrityam. God is only one without a second. It is mentioned in Sutrasthara Upanishad, chapter number 6, verse number 9. Na chasya kasij, janita na chadipa, which means of that Lord. He has got no superior, he has got no lords, he has got no parents, he has got no father, he has got no mother. Furthermore, it is mentioned in Sutrasthara Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19. Na tasya pratima asti, of that God, there is no pratima. Pratima? In Sanskrit, it means images, photographs, sculptures, paintings, statues, pictures, idols, etc. Almighty God, He has got no images, He has got no photographs, He has got no painting, He has got no sculpture, He has got no image. Among the Hindu scriptures, the most widely read book is the Bhagavad Gita. It's mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 7, verse number 20. That all those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires, they worship the demigods. And demigods, it means false gods. It refers to idols. It's mentioned in Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 10, verse number 3, that they know me as the unborn, beginningless, supreme Lord of all the worlds. Among the Hindu scriptures, one of the most sacred are the Vedas. The most sacred among the Hindu scriptures are the Vedas. It's mentioned in Yajurved, chapter number 32, verse number 3. Na tasi pratima asti. Of that God, there is no pratima. Pratima, as I mentioned earlier, it means images, photographs, sculptures, paintings, statues, pictures, idols, etc. Furthermore, it's mentioned in Yajurved, chapter number 40, verse number 8. Almighty God, He is imageless and pure. It's mentioned in Yajurved, chapter number 40, verse number 9. Andhatma pravishanti ya asambuti mupaste. They are entering into darkness, those who worship the asambuti. That is the natural things like fire, water, air, etc. And the verse continues and says, They are entering more in darkness, those who worship the sambuti. That is the created things like table, chair, idols, etc. Who says that? Yajurved, 
chapter number 40, verse number 9. Furthermore, it's mentioned Athar of Aved, book number 20, hymn number 58, mantra number 3. Dev Maha Osi, verily great is Almighty God. It's mentioned Rigved, book number 1, hymn number 164, mantra number 46. Ekam Sat Viprabhauda Vidante. Truth is one, God is one, but sages and saintly people call him by a variety of names. And there are no less than 33 different attributes given to Almighty God in Rig Ved, book number 2, hymn number 1. And it is mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 2, hymn number 1, mantra number 3. Almighty God is called as Brahma, which means the Creator God. Or in Arabic, it is called as Khaliq. We Muslims, we have got no objection if anyone calls Almighty God as Khalik or the Creator. But if anyone says that Almighty God is Brahma, who has got four heads and on each head he has a crown, then we Muslims lay strict objection against it. Moreover, you are giving an image to God and you are going against Sutastara Panishad. Chapter number 4, verse number 19, which says, Na tispatima asti. Of that God, there is no pratima. Another attribute given to Almighty God in Rig Ved, book number two, hymn number one, mantra number three is another attribute given to Almighty God in Rig Ved, book number two, hymn number one, mantra number three is. Almighty God, He is called as Vishnu, which is the sustainer God, which somewhat refers to as Rab. We Muslims, we have got no objection if anyone calls Almighty God as the sustainer or cherisher or Rab. But if anyone says that Almighty God is Vishnu, who has got four hands, and one of his right hand he has the chakra that the discus, and in the left hand he has the conch, and he's flying on the bird of Garuda or reclining on the bed of snakes, we Muslims lay strict objection against it. Moreover, you are giving an image to God, and you are going against your Jurved. Chapter number thirty-two, verse number three, which says, "Na tasipati ma asti." Of that God, there is no image. Furthermore, it's mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 8, hymn number 1, mantra number 1. Ma chadan yadvi sansad. Do not worship anyone but Him alone. Praise Him alone. It's mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 6, hymn number 45, mantra number 16. Ya ik musti. Worship Him alone. Praise Him alone. And the Brahma Sutra, the fundamental creed of Hinduism is Ekam Braham Dutya Naste. Nehna Naste Kinchan. Bhagwan Eki hai, Dusra Nahi hai, Nahi hai, Nahi hai, Zabi Nahi hai. There's only one God, not a second one. Not at all, not at all, not in the least bit. So if you read the Hindu scriptures, you shall understand Hinduism in the right perspective. And you shall understand the concept of God in Hinduism. They have to worship only one God who has got no images and you have to worship Him alone. Now let's discuss the concept of God in Judaism. It's mentioned in the Old Testament in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 6, verse number 4. Shama Israelo, Adnaila Hainrad Yer O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. It's mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 43, verse number 11. I, even I, am the God, and there's no Savior besides me. It's mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 45, verse number 5. I, even I, am the God, and there's no God besides me. It's mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 46, verse number 9. I, even I, am the God, and there is none like me. It's mentioned in the book of Exodus, chapter number 20, verse number 3 to 5. Thou shall have no other God besides me. 
Thou shalt not make any graven image of any likeness of anything in the heaven above, in the earth beneath, in the water beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, thy Lord, thy God, is a jealous God. The same message is repeated in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 5, verse number 7 to 9. Thou shalt have no other God besides me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image of any likeness of anything in the heaven above, in the earth beneath, in the water beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, thy Lord, thy God, is a jealous God. So if you read the Jewish scriptures, you shall understand the concept of God in Judaism. And you shall understand Judaism in the right perspective. They have to worship only one God. And you have to worship Him alone. Now let's discuss the concept of God in Christianity. Before I discuss the concept of God in Christianity, I'd like to make a few points clear. Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith for its followers to believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe that he was the Messiah, translated Christ. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention, which many modern day Christians today do not believe. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe that he healed those born blind and lepers with God's permission. The Muslims and the Christians, we are going together. But one may ask, then where are the parting of ways? The parting of ways are, there are many Christians who say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he claimed divinity. He said that he was almighty God. In fact, if you read the Bible, there is not a single unequivocal statement, not a single unambiguous statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says, I am God, or where he says, worship me. In fact, if you read the Bible, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, as mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28, my father is greater than I, Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, my father is greater than all, Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28, I cast out devil with the Spirit of God, Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20, I with the finger of God, cast out devil, Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. Anyone who says, I seek not my will, but the will of my Father, but the will of Almighty God, he's a Muslim. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was a Muslim. And it is clearly mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 17 to 20. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, Think not, I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I have come not to destroy, but to fulfill. For till the heavens and the earth shall pass, not one jot or tittle of the law or the commandments shall be broken. For if anyone breaks one of the least of the commandments and teaches men to do so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. For if anyone keeps the commandments and teaches men to do so, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, in no way shall you enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he never said that if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, believe that I am God, believe that I died on the cross for the sins, but he rather said that if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must keep the commandments. And Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. He never claimed divinity. In fact, if you read, it is mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 24. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, The words that you hear are not mine, but my Father who has sent me. It is mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 17, verse number 3. This is eternal life that you may know. That there's one God. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he never claimed divinity. In fact, if you read it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 19, verse number 16 and 17, a man approached Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and said, O good master, what good things 
I should do that I shall attain eternal life. Jesus Christ, please one replies and says, Why thou call it me good? There is only one good and that is Almighty God. And if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must keep the commandments. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, never said that if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, believe that I am God, believe that I died on the cross for the sins. But he rather said that if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must keep the commandments. And Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, leave aside. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, Why thou called me good? Leave aside calling me God. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, Why thou called me good? There is only one good and that is Almighty God. And it is clearly mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, verse number 22. Ye men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs, which God did by himself and you are witness to it. A man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs, which God did by himself and you are witness to it. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he never claimed divinity. In fact, if you read, he repeated verbatim what was said by Moses, peace be upon him. It is mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 12, verse number 29. Shama Israelo. Adnai la haina adnai khad. Yar o Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. This is mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 12, verse number 29. So if you read, the Christian scriptures. You shall understand the concept of God in Christianity. And you shall understand Christianity in the right perspective. Then you have to worship only one God and you have to worship Him alone. Now let's discuss the concept of God in Islam. The best reply that any Muslim can give you regarding the concept of God in Islam is quote to Surah Ikhlas. Chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4. Kul wa Allahu ahad. Say he is Allah, the one and only. Allah samad. Allah, the absolute, the eternal. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. Wa lam yakul lahu kufran ahad. And there is nothing like unto him. This surah ikhlas is a four-line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the touchstone of theology. Theo in Greek means Lord and logi means study. Thus theology means study of God. And if anyone says that so and so candidate is almighty God and if that candidate fits in this four-line definition, we Muslims, we have got no objection in accepting that candidate as God. Like before, you buy gold, you will verify the gold, whether it is 24 karat gold, whether it is 22 karat gold, whether it is 18 karat gold, or whether it is not gold at all. Because all that glitters is not gold. Similarly, this surah ikhlas is a touchstone of theology. And if anyone claims that so and so candidate is almighty God, and if that candidate fits in this four line definition, we Muslims, we have got no objection in accepting that candidate as God. Now there are many human beings who say that Bhagwan Rajneesh is Almighty God. Now let's put this Bhagwan Rajneesh to the test of Surah Ikhlas. The first is, Qul huwa Allahu Ahad. Say He is Allah the one and only. Was Bhagwan Rajneesh one and only? There are several people who have claimed divinity. And especially from the country India where I come from, there are thousands and thousands of people who have claimed divinity. So he's not one and only. <coughs> the second is Allah Samad. Allah, the absolute, the eternal. Was Bhagwan Rajdi's absolute and eternal? We know from his biography that he was suffering from asthma, from chronic backache, from diabetes mellitus. Imagine Almighty God suffering from asthma, from chronic backache, from diabetes mellitus. The third test is Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. We know Bhagwan Rajneesh, he was born in the state of Madhya Pradesh in India. And in 1981, he goes to USA and in the state of Oregon, he starts his village called as Rajneeshpuram. 
and he takes thousands of Americans for a ride. Later on, the American government, they imprisoned Bhagwan Rajneesh. And Bhagwan Rajneesh was saying that the American government, they were slow poisoning him. Imagine Almighty God being slow poisoned. Later on, the American government, they kick Bhagwan Rajesh out of America and he comes back to India and in the city of Pune, he starts his village. And if you happen to go to Pune, on his tomb, on his Samadhi, it is mentioned. Bhagwan Rajneesh, Osho Rajneesh, never born, never died, but visited the earth from the 11th of December 1931 to the 19th of January 1990. Never born, never died, but visited the earth from the 11th of December 1931 to the 19th of January 1990. They forgot to mention on the tomb that he was not granted visas to 21 different countries of the world. Imagine Almighty God coming down to the earth requiring visas to travel to different countries of the world. And the Archbishop of Greece said that if you do not throw Rajneesh out of the country, we shall burn his house as well as the house of his disciples. And the last test is so stringent that it does not befit anyone but the true Almighty God. The moment you can compare God to anything in this world, He is not God. And there is nothing like unto Him. So this Surah Ikhlas is a four-line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the touchstone of theology. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 110, قُلِدُ اللَّهُ أَبِدُ الرَّحْمَانِ أَيَّمَّا تَدَعُوا فَلَهُ الْأَسْمَعُ الْحُسْنَى Say, call upon him by Allah, or call him by Rahman, by whichever name you call upon him, to him belong the most beautiful names. And there are no less than 99 different attributes and names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are mentioned in the glorious Quran and in the authentic hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa For example, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Hakim. But the crowning one is Allah. Now why do we Muslims prefer calling Allah with the Arabic word Allah instead of the English word God? Because a person can play mischief with the English word God. For example, if we add S to God, so it becomes God's, that is the plural of God. There is nothing like the plural of Allah. Kul Allahu ahad. Say He is Allah, the one and only. If we add DESS to God, so it becomes Goddess, that is a female God. There is nothing like female Allah or male Allah in Islam. If he had father to God, so it becomes Godfather, he is my Godfather, he is my guardian. There is nothing like Allah Father or Allah by Islam. If he had mother to God, so it becomes Godmother. There is nothing like Allah Mother or Allah me in Islam. If we prefix tin to God, so it becomes tin God, that is a fake God. There is nothing like tin Allah or fake Allah in Islam. That is the reason we Muslims prefer calling Allah with the Arabic word Allah instead of the English word God. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Yusuf, chapter number 12, verse number 106, وَمَا يُؤْمِنُ أَكْثَرْهُمْ بِاللَّهِ إِلَّا وَهُمْ مُشْرِكُونَ And most of them believe in Allah, but while associating partners with him. So basically there are three categories, there are three categories of Tawheed. So basically there are three categories of Tawheed. Tawheed al-Rububiyyah, that is maintaining the unity of Allah's Lordship. Tawheed al-Ibadah, maintaining the unity of Allah's Lordship, that He is the only God who is worthy of worship alone. And the third is 
Tawheed al asmai wa Sifat, maintaining the unity of Allah's names and attribute. All three categories of Tawheed are equally important. If any one of the three categories of Tawheed they are missing, then you are committing shirk. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 18. Summum bukmun amyun fahum la yarji'oon. The deaf, the dumb, the blind, they will never return to the straight path. And a similar message is mentioned in the Bible. It is mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 13, verse number 13. Seeing they see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. A similar message is mentioned in the Hindu scriptures. It is mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 10, hymn number 71, mantra number 4. Some see the world, yet they see it not. Others hear the world, yet they hear it not. So all these scriptures, they are explicitly mentioning that you have to worship only one God who has got no images and you have to worship Him alone. Yet there are some people who behave like deaf, dumb and blind and they do not pay heed to the message. And most of the human beings, they say that if Almighty God can do anything and everything, then why can't He become a human being? The moment Almighty God becomes a human being, He ceases to be God. Because the qualities of Almighty God and human beings, they are opposite. Human beings, we are mortal. Almighty God, He is immortal. You cannot have a mortal and immortal person at the same time. Human beings, we've got a beginning. Almighty God, He has got no beginning. You cannot have a person with no beginning and beginning at the same time. It's meaningless. It's like you telling me, I saw a tall short man. Either you can see a tall man, or a short man, or a medium heighted man. You cannot see a tall short man at the same time. It's like you telling me, I saw a fat thin man. Either you can see a fat man, or a thin man, or a medium man. You cannot see a fat thin man. Therefore, the moment Almighty God becomes a human being, He ceases to be God. And if in the same argument, that Almighty God can do anything and everything, then Almighty God, He can even tell a lie, Nauzubillah, Almighty God, He can even make a mistake, He can even forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 52, La yudillu rabbi wa la yansa. My Lord, He never errs, He never forgets. And the same argument, that if Almighty God can do anything and everything, then Almighty God, He can even do injustice, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 40, Inna Allah la yadlu mithqala darra. Allah does not commit injustice, even in the least bit. And we human beings, we require to eat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An'am, chapter number 6, verse number 14, wa huwa yut'imu wa la yut'am. And He feeds, but He is not fed. We human beings, we require to rest, we require to sleep. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 255, the ayat al kursi Allahu la ilaha illahu al hayyu al qayyum la ta'akhudhu sinatu wa la naum that Allah there is no God worthy of worship except Him alone no slumber can seize Him nor does He require to sleep we human beings we require to rest we require to sleep so the moment Almighty God becomes a human being, He ceases to be God. Because the qualities of Almighty God and human beings, they are opposite. And most of the religions, except for Islam, they believe in a philosophy known as anthropomorphism. That is Almighty God becoming a human being. And they give a very good logic, a very good bluff. That they say that you know Almighty God, He's so pure, He's so holy, He does not know the shortcomings of a human being, so He has to become a human being to know what is good and bad for the human being. On the face of it, it's a very good logic. But for example, if I manufacture a Blu-ray player or a DVD player, I do not have to become a Blu-ray player or a DVD player to know what is good and bad for the DVD player. To know what is good and bad for the Blu-ray player. What do I do? I write an instruction manual. 
If you want to play the disc, put the disc in and press the play button. If you want to do fast forward, press the FF button. Don't drop it from the height, it will get damaged. Don't immerse it in water, it will get spoiled. I write an instructional manual. I do not have to become a Blu-ray player. I do not have to become a DVD player to know what is good and bad for the Blu-ray player. To know what is good and bad for the DVD player. I write an instructional manual. Therefore, the last and final instructional manual for us human beings, it is the glorious Quran. The do's and don'ts are mentioned in the glorious Quran. Therefore, Almighty God need not become a human being to know what is good and bad for the human being. He writes an instructional manual and he chooses a man amongst men and communicates with him at a higher level through the form of revelation. So therefore, Almighty God need not become a human being to know what is good and bad for the human being. So this was in brief regarding the concept of God in Islam. So in order to understand Islam in the right perspective, you need to understand the concept of God in Islam. So this was in brief regarding the different various world religions, the four major world religions of the world. And in order to understand any religion in the right perspective, you should look at the authentic sources and you should try and understand the concept of God in that religion. I would like to end my talk with the quotation from the glorious Quran from Surah Nahl, chapter number 16, verse number 125. Invite the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preachings and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious.